see we have an excellent panel both with respect to quality and also quantity. Um, so we'll have to uh, keep moving today. And so welcome to the session which is on change and change management. Any change problem has really two components, two very difficult components. One of them is what to change, and the other one is uh, how to change. Now, to succeed in the next decade, I think that enterprises and institutions will need to completely reinvent themselves in a post-COVID world, not only with respect to shifts in the uh, environment due to the pandemic, but also with respect to sustainability, the rise of AI, uh, and the unpredictability and dynamism that results from both of those factors, as well, as, well as many others. Now, the problem is that um, organizations spend most of their time, of course, optimizing the efficiency of their business models, and their models, their mental models and their business models become very entrenched, which is probably why organizations have inertia and 75% of major change efforts fail. So the two questions I'd like to explore with uh, uh, today's um, excellent panel are essentially what we need to change and, um, and how we can uh, successfully change. So I'll abbreviate the introductions because you've already heard who is on the panel. And we're gonna kick off with a, a stimulus presentation uh, from uh, Eve who is an expert on business model uh, uh, in innovation. So we'll, after hearing from him for about 15 minutes, uh, then we'll uh, discuss some of the points that he, he raises about change and change management. So over to you, Eve, for your stimulus. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and I will try to share some ideas on business model innovation and especially I will focus on business model with purpose. Well, with Alex, we started to work together uh, 20 years ago and we created some visual tools for helping entrepreneurs and companies innovators. Let me briefly show you what's the startup journey. You have an idea, you search for the right business model, then you launch and you try to grow just to survive. It's a messy process at the beginning, especially where you first invent business model and then in a the second stage, you try to improve it or maybe to reinvent business model. So we defined some tools for helping entrepreneurs to invent business model and then entrepreneurs or innovators to shift from an existing one to a better one. And it's a design process. So it means that it requires a design mindset where you design and, and you test and it's a messy process as I mentioned um, previously. For existing company, the challenge are a little bit different. For existing company, uh, first, they manage a set of business models most of the time because of the history of the company. And they exploit, execute the current business model, bringing money inside your company. But they need also to explore new business model for creating new growth engines or just for replacing some declining business model in the execution exploit portfolio. And we help them when we have created a tool for helping to manage the portfolios of business model, both in exploit and explore. And the company needs to be good at both. They need to be good in exploiting business model, but also in exploring. We say sometimes they need to be ambidextrous. And if they are good at that, they are becoming what we call short-term invincible company. So it means company is able to constantly reinvent itself, agility. Second, to compete on superior business models and not only on product, not only on technology, and third, maybe sometimes to be able to transcend industry boundaries. And those three characteristics are quite good also to become resilient in face of crisis. I will come back on this. And as I mentioned today, I will mainly focus on business model with purpose, not only uh, for profit, if you want. So companies able to develop social equity, uh, environmental stewardship, and so on. And I think this matter more today than ever before because of the crisis, uh, because of the COVID crisis, because of the uh, technology, as you mentioned, because of the uh, climate crisis. And I will try to illustrate it in three different contexts. First, when you try to invent a new business model for the future. 
Second, when you shift towards a, an existing business model towards a new business model with purpose. And finally, when you manage a portfolio of several business models and you try to manage a portfolio with purpose. And I will start with three examples. First, Patagonia. Since the beginning, the founder here, Yvon Schwunach, say, my purpose is we are in business to save our planet. And so they created a business model with a lot of activities, new ways of doing something with a value proposition for customers with revenues coming from. My main uh, point is they invented building an impact business from the start, since the beginning. They decided to align activities to environmental objectives and accept higher activity costs. Second, they develop sustainable value proposition for their customers and make them feel they are contributing to protecting the environment. And finally, they apply a premium pricing higher for revenue because customers accept that environmental friendly production comes at cost. I think three main characteristics for creating a, an impact business, if you want. Second example for me, Austin, different situation. It used to be an oil, gas, coal extraction company, and they decided to become green, creating these wind firms in the North Sea, uh, north of Denmark. We used to be part of the problem. Just a decade ago, we were one of the most fossil fuel intensive energy companies in Europe. Today, we are ranked the most sustainable company in the world. And why should you care about that? Well, because our story is proof that it is possible for a fossil fuel energy company to change. The vast majority of the world's energy still comes from fossil fuels. If we want to fight climate change, we need to transform the world's energy system and build a global energy system. Okay, so it means that they used to be a fossil fuel energy company and they became a green energy provider. Three main characteristics or shift if you want. First, they decided to shift or to apply the offshore know-how and resources of drilling operations to building this offshore wind farms. Second, they shift from its drilling low tech value proposition to new high-tech green power plants with new technology. And finally, they also decided to shift from volatility, volatile transactional revenues to predictable fixed price recurring revenues based on subscription to provide a green energy. Second example, a shift from an existing business model towards a new business model with purpose. And finally, another company, much more complicated because it's a huge company, Unilever. And so under the leadership of Paul Polman, they decided to adopt a new purpose for this company, make sustainable living commonplace. So we believe that a, an equitable and sustainable growth model does not have to come at the expense of uh, either top or bottom line growth. In fact, if that is your strategy, I would submit it actually accelerates your top and bottom line growth, and that is what we're trying to show. And so far, uh, also with our shareholders, which is one of our stakeholder groups, uh, we've translated that into a reasonable return. Uh, I personally believe that more so in this world than in any other world that we, uh, that we live in, uh, companies that are in tune with society, uh, closer to the needs of the population at large, after all, we're a consumer goods company, are better placed to be successful, and that is the essence of this model. It's a growth model. Okay, so they manage a portfolio with different business models, and they <coughs> decided to take some action to change this uh, portfolio business model. So they decided to incorporate sustainability into an existing portfolio. Three actions for them. They try to improve current businesses with biodegradable, less water, educational tools, Second, they decided to acquire companies, external companies, they put inside their portfolio for reinforcing their own business model with natural, organic food, eco-friendly products. And they also divided to divers and drop not aligned brands, quite successfully uh, since that time. So what we have very quickly seen is business models with purpose, where they try first or to invent with Patagonia, shift with uh, Austin, 
and manage with Unilever example. Leadership matters, and clearly we have seen the CEOs of those companies or the founder was a key uh, asset, if you want, in this transformation or uh, this invention or reinvention or uh, portfolio evolution. But le leadership matters, clear, but culture is everything. Let me visit uh, again Patagonia because they had a second purpose, a company where employees treat work as play. We wanted to have a job where we would be allowed to do that. And then we wanted to work with friends. We didn't want to work with MBAs and... <laughs> uh, you know, and we wanted to break the rules of business. I mean, there's, there's a lot of fun in breaking the rules. And uh, we didn't want to do it the way everybody did. Uh, and we wanted to blur the distinction between work and play and family. So we wanted to have our kids with us at work. We didn't want to just leave them at home. I, I got 70-something percent kids. And so, you know, we were bringing our kids in and putting them on our desk in a cardboard box. <laughs> that was just part of the deal. I had a lot of employees that are barefooted at work all the time. Who cares? All I care is that the work is done. And so to do that, you have to hire self-motivated, very intelligent people who know their job, and then you leave them alone. OK, so this is one example. You know, culture is key. Let me uh, give you also uh, what we call innovation myth with Alex. Most of the time, managers believe that the challenge is business innovation, business model creation, invention, reinvention, is to find the right idea, execute the plan, check the results, avoid failure, predict the future based on the past, because they think that it's project management. And this one is good for managing the exploit portfolio. It's clear that you need to cherish to management, systematic improvement, growth of existing businesses, processes, and so on. But for Explore, it's not good because in exploring new business model, reinventing business model, changing a portfolio, the exploration culture cultivates creation, discovery, validation. So you need to come with a new culture. And here I will finish with, how is it possible to assess if your own organization is able to innovate, to create new business model or to renovate uh, existing business model. And here you will see Alex, my co-author, my friends, uh, giving you three questions. You only need to look at three things, leadership support, organizational design, and your innovation practice. And there are three simple metrics to look at. First one, how much time does your CEO spend on innovation? If it's not 20 to 40% of his or her time every week, you won't get innovation. Second one is where innovation lives in the org chart. If it doesn't live at the very top, growth and innovation, and that's not R&D or the CTO, no, a full-time job, growth and innovation that reports to the CEO, if that doesn't exist, you won't get innovation. And the third one is innovation practice, which means your ability to constantly explore new ideas, make small investments, let teams start testing ideas, but then rapidly kill those ideas that don't produce evidence so you can constantly you know, reallocate capital in those ideas that are really working. So that's how you let winners emerge. Okay, so three things. First, you need to have a lead, strong leadership support. It's not only money, but it's also the time spent by leadership on innovation. Second, uh, innovation needs to be at top of the org chart, somewhere very key. Why? Because you need to give them legitimacy and power to come with this or helping them to create this uh, growth engine inside the company. And finally, uh, you need to develop some innovation practices, which is not the same as managing the existing portfolio with the ability to kill project, to kill innovation project, just to be sure that you manage a funnel of project where some are successful and some maybe less. And here's my, the end. So for me and for us with Alex, make sure you don't forget to reinvent your business model when you bet 
on technology to in, uh, innovate, uh, to invent the future or reinvent the future. Thank you, and Martin, you can Thanks, maybe Steve, for that very come uh, with a question. excellent uh, stimulus. Um, yeah, I, if I may be a, um, um, a little bit devil's advocate, I think every business book which has been written in the last 50 years, the first chapter says, change is more than ever, faster than ever, deeper than ever. You, what you say seems to imply that it's really true this time. Uh, is, is the need for change in enterprises, the need for innovation greater than ever? And if so, uh, what, what makes it so? <coughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it's, we more need it or not. I could say it's a little bit more uh, complicated, a little bit more difficult. Why? Uh, because if you see some past crisis when we came with this idea of change management, I think the problem was identified. The impact of this problem was short term and the solution or the toolbox of solution to solve those problems were quite well known. Today, it seems that further problem is not so clearly defined because it's so complicated to anticipate the impact, which are quite long-term, if you think, for example, the environmental issues. And so the solution to solve those problems that you don't know exactly is more, much more complicated. So <clears throat> problems, <clears throat> not clearly defined. Second, impact long-term, so difficult to anticipate inside your organization. And third, solution quite complicated to find. Is it quite Th clear for you, Mark? Yes, thank you for that, Eve. That's, that's quite clear. So we've heard a strategist perspective. Let's uh, hear now from an economist. Um, Tom, as you look at these forces uh, on enterprises causing them to change and innovate, from an economist perspective, what's What's driving change? How do you interpret this, uh, what's going on here? Yeah, uh, so I'm a macroeconomist, and um, let me mention, let me j mention one force that is, uh, that is present right now, um, that hasn't been present for, um, for a number of decades. And it's, um, it's because of the pandemic, um, Treasuries and central banks um, in, in Europe and the United States have responded in a way that they, um, they, they basically responded during World War I and World War II. Um, we've run, um, in the US, we've run uh, huge deficits that have been financed uh, mainly by the central bank, by the Federal Reserve. Similar thing is in Europe. And one consequence of that is um, inflation has been unleashed, um, partly because of that, and partly because of um, some some supply shocks um, um, that we're all talking about, and these are these are macroeconomic effects in the sense that they're they're influencing the entire environment on all forms. And um, and uh, the last time in, inflation happened like this in the in the in the in, in the U.S. at least, partly in Europe, uh, was in the 1970s. Um, in which the um, the model that uh, you know the quote unquote model or way of of, of uh, doing business with the Federal Reserve and the, and counterparts in Europe um, got out of whack, and it took a long time to uh, to fix that. Um, um, you know, a, a substantial inflation uh, followed by uh, you know in the U.S. a big recession that the Fed engineered to to break it. So. Um, you know, we all know that central banks now are talking about, well, is the inflation now transitory or temporary? How long is it gonna go? And the reason inflation causes trouble is, uh, is, is for firms, is it, uh, it makes price, and for firms and unions, workers, it makes it hard to figure out uh, how much of a price change is a, is a relative price change relative to other um, firms and other commodities, and how much is general, and uh, it makes price setting for for firms much much harder. So um, there there's a there's a danger that um, that firms are going to be put back in the in the environment that they were in the 1970s, um, and um, and in while this is all going on, um, additional. Uh, social mandates are being put on central banks that they're they're probably not very good at, um, you know, solving um, 
uh, equity problems and um, and and uh, problems with racism and diversity. Um, those are important problems, but but um, you know the central bank's problem is uh, is inflation. So you got kind of have mission creep. So I would watch for that. That's going to affect all businesses. Th thank you very much, Tom. So in addition to the forces of uh, technology and, and, and health and, and sustainability, we probably need to uh, navigate turbulent economic times too, I, I hear you saying. Um, so let's move on to um, an operational perspective from two uh, executives that are very familiar with uh, major change programs. Maybe I can start with you, Sean. Um, so change programs are hard. Um, as I said earlier, many of them uh, fail to meet their goals. Um, and I know you're engaged in a major digital change program now. What, what do you believe is critical to success in, in changing the fabric of a company? I think the, the percentage you, you listed, I think culture sometimes can impact the change. I've seen upwards of 78, 83% that you can have a change journey mapped out, a digital transformation mapped out. But if you don't have the culture behind it, uh, it'll stay on the PowerPoint and it will not translate into execution. I think the important part for any sort of change, specifically with digital, because it does change the underlying makeup oftentimes of how the organization and the business models are laid out, is you have to drive some level of speed, some pathfinder projects where you can test out these new muscles and capabilities and prove them out to the organization where you can start to show, get evangelists inside the organization and show impact and show it not in years, but in increments, 90 day sprints, 90 day sprints. And then to have the fortitude to be able to stop if your hypothesis around a certain activity was um, misfounded or the, the actual customer reacts in a way that you didn't expect and to turn your prioritization and funding into other directions. So that's one half of the equation. You have to move with speed and you have to start to build that belief inside the organization that it can, you can ap, um, operate differently. The other half is you do have to create a sustaining structure, a scaffolding uh, that one defines what digital will be for your organization or any sort of change, any sort of transformation and make that definition very clear to be able to drive prioritization and funding and resource allocation into that. For 3M, you know, a 120 year old company that's founded on innovation, mainly in the material science space, this was one of the most critical elements was to clearly define a digital framework for the future. And we outlined that in four key outcome areas, digital customer, digital product, digital operations, and digital enterprise. And with e each of those four areas, we drove a prioritization of activities. And that's where we did those rapid sprints, where we could test that out. And we could start to move resources towards those areas that showed greater value. Um, we did have three enablers as well, data and analytics. With all of these changes, data and analytics is an underlying element that uh, you, you have to build out that expertise, uh, either through partners orig initially or through, with, throughout your own staff. And that has to be a mindset. So a digital culture, a digital mindset, digital fluency, that was the other element. And a digital, digital acumen, starting to bring talent in, but also give individuals inside the organization a way to learn and to level up. And so to clearly have a digital acumen split out for marketing, R&D, selling, because it is gonna be different, different products, different ways of interacting with your customer. And then finally, with our transformation, we looked at an underlying foundation. We looked at scaled partnerships and scaled platforms that would spread across the organization. So as we did start to take steps forward, that there was a scaffolding in place to be able to hold the opportunities that we captured, hold the lessons that we'd learned, and to have reusable technology blocks that each of the divisions, functions, and groups would be able to leverage. So we did not have to reinvent the wheel in many of these cases. So it's transformation is very challenging. Um, I really think the key is those two elements. You have to move with some speed so you can build momentum and belief, but you have to also have a scaffolding in place so you can capture those wins 
and hold that line and build from that for the future and keep leveling up. Um, let me ask a, a follow-up, if I may, Sean, because you were very centered on digital transformation. Um, I'm wondering, is digital transformation, obviously the things that you change, the software and so on, the processes, uh, it's different, but is it essentially different as a change uh, process? Is it fundamentally different from, say, um, you know, cost reductions or you know, market-oriented transform transformations that you may have carried out before? And if so, what is that essential difference? That's a great question. And I think it depends on the organization. So for, for certain organizations that maybe are more digital natives, where they had and they grew up with digital technologies, it's no different. It is their bread and butter. So maybe a transformation of how are they are going to drive uh, change into a new markets, or I think a lot of the focus on sustainability can be critical. For companies that really have not had digital expertise or digital is not, technology has not, not been part of their core product, the change is much larger. It's a much larger transformation journey. Uh, some of the leaps have to be bigger. Some of the change management internally has to be bigger. Breaking some of the organizational inertia that maybe is not ready to take steps forward will be harder. Uh, so oftentimes you have to look and that definition of what digital is and what that path is going to be is gonna be different for every company. So there is no playbook. You really have to look at that baseline uh, and, and look at how that is gonna affect even inside a company, for instance, like 3M, there are certain business groups that are much more digitally savvy. They're built on commercial products that are pure standalone digital. But then there's other areas that are working on roof granules and you know, products that go into safety equipment. Uh, and so the, the definition is very critical. And as you think about prioritization and pathways, I think it's important for every organization to look at where are they starting and how are they going to take those first steps with speed and then structure to hold those wins across the organization. Thank you, Sean. Um, Olivier, can I move to, to you? You um, have also been involved with um, digital transformation at uh, Dassault Systems. Um, you probably have a different starting point because if I understand correctly, you, the part of the company you manage is essentially a software company. So you already have a lot of the, the capabilities. Um, so what is, what is special and, and critical about success in uh, digital transformation in, in your experience? Thanks, Martin. Uh, as you just mentioned, we are really uh, a science-based uh, software company uh, providing modeling and simulation software for uh, engineering companies, but also medical companies and construction cities and territories. So we, we are actually engaged in, in a, quite a lot of transformation programs for companies, as Eve mentioned before, who are either inventing themselves or completely reinventing themselves. And what we have seen is that um, the, the, the three pillars of what defines a sustainable transformation and or transformation towards sustainability is to really ensure that from the get-go, uh, the entire company thinks about the sustainability of their products and services, the sustainability of their organization and people, and the sustainability of their business. And if you really put uh, everything you do in terms of digital transformation, not only in the context of digitalizing past processes, but really transforming deeply uh, your core processes, your core methods, then you can unleash a, a level of innovation and a level of sustainability that you didn't have before. So when we think about product and services sustainability, it's obviously about uh, reducing carbon footprint, uh, cost of material, cost of transportation, and be as efficient and, and lean as possible. And we believe that the technologies of uh, modeling and simulation help run plenty of what-if scenarios that you can practice in the virtual world, including business decisions virtually, and then test them. And once you are sure that they will work, implement them. So it's moving from a document-based uh, way of working, a, a PowerPoint-based way of working, to something that is a true virtual twin of your business model, of your enterprise, and your uh, products and solutions. But it doesn't fly if your organization is not ready for change, is not ready for transformation, is not ready to truly be itself sustainable. 
Many of us across Europe have a big challenge, and also in the US and to some extent in Russia, have a big challenge. Many of the engineering teams who have been creating the products and services we have today are going to retire pretty soon. So the question is, how do we transfer, how do we transmit all of this knowledge and know-how that has been capitalized in companies to the next generation? So sustainability is also about the people and the organization retain, attract talents, but also prepare the move to the next generation. And all of that uh, is not lasting long if your business itself is not sustainable. And Eve mentioned that in introduction, it's about continuous reinvention of the business model. It's about continuous reinvention of your value network, people surrounding you, not only people in your company, but also the extended network of suppliers, partners, universities, labs that you connect with. And we have seen that all the companies we partner with who have been really, really successful in their transformation, pay attention to the three pillars of their sustainability. Sustainability of product and services, organization and people, and business model. So, so let me ask you a more controversial question, Olivier. Um, that, as you know, one of the things that uh, we do every year is we, we rank all public companies in the world according to what I call their vitality. The vitality means not their current performance, not their size, uh, not their reputation, but their propensity for future growth. And um, Dassault Systems always scores very high, especially among European companies. But if we look at all companies in Europe, it's pretty clear that this major technological driver of uh, change is, is mainly concentrated in US and Chinese companies. So I wonder whether you have any thoughts on the competitiveness of, of, of Europe as an environment for pursuing technological transformation. No, I mean, when, when you look at um, hard facts, hard evidences, the, the World Economic Forum recently published again uh, some very interesting indicators about uh, innovation. Uh, Eve uh, lives in a country that is continuously and constantly ranked as the number one country in the world in terms of innovation. So you can argue on uh, how it has been calculated, but when you really look at that from an objective standpoint, looking at the number of universities, patents, penetration of uh, internet and 5G, number of startups, volume of venture capital, you will see that Europe is actually scoring quite, quite well uh, and is remaining an epicenter of, of innovation. But what is clear is that uh, the European companies have taken and the Russian companies have deli deliberately taken a stance on their own sustainability. We ourselves uh, joined the Dow Jones uh, Sustainability Index. We continue to work very closely with companies on their target, uh, uh, science-based target initiatives. So I'm very optimistic about the fact that uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Russia, which is a part of the world I'm looking at for, for the system, is and will remain extremely competitive. Thank you. So um, let's move on next to uh, uh, Maxime. Um, Maxime, um, you run a very large enterprise, the Russian Postal Service. You uh, 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 in the midst of a, a major digital transformation. Um, tell us about uh, what you've learned about success and failure in major change programs. Thank you so much. I would like to say that I carefully was taking note uh, because some of the answers I was not talking uh, to them ahead of time. I wanted to comment in terms of practices because I do work with challenges um, uh, in our business model is very unstable. We are a post operator and like others, UPS, Deutsche Pol, DHL or Singapore Post, which are benchmarks in our industry. All of them are living through difficult times because uh, logistics, uh, marketplaces, e-commerce, uh, it's an opportunity and challenge for us at the same time. So the questions are very simple. How do you make uh, this model more sustainable? How do you quickly respond to client demands? How do you uh, develop products uh, quickly and you introduce innovations? Not all the changes I'm going to mention have been implemented, but this is the way we're following 
And this is my program of changes at uh, the Russian Post. First of all, a product should be in the center of company's life. It's a practical thing because the business processes in the company should uh, ret uh, rotate around products and product teams. If, if you don't give uh, them freedom, if they don't follow this product logic, if they're not incentivized to do it, if resources are not there for product management, so unlike uh, old practices, uh, so when so when uh, cor when parking lots were given to corporate bosses, so so that was done because those people generate income for the company. Another thing is a little bit different. Digital solutions. Um, are not in our digital unit. We don't have such a digital unit. I don't think if... So here's the person responsible for digital transformation. Uh, we don't have a digital, a separate digital agenda because uh, it's going to cover everything. Basically, if you, you have main logistical uh, ga guy and, and he's not a digital apostle, it's not going to work. Even if, if he's my first deputy, you will not be able to develop great digital products and logistics will not be uh, digital, but logistics is our main business. We uh, move uh, uh, billions of units per year, and no, uh, there is no such special department that can transform us. So ownership of our internal processes, uh, our ERP systems and production systems, sorting TMS, VMS, um, it, all it all became um, digital, and their owners are digital. Of course, we have more and more developers. We have up to 2,000 developers, those who develop those digital solutions for us. And th same thing about support. Support should you aim at products. It's very hard because as a country and the culture of control is very common, culture of safety and, and for state-owned companies, it's very characteristic. And to change uh, finances, procurement, personnel, HR, uh, to change all of those things is very hard. It's a very difficult task to do. And lastly, uh, also shift in motivation. We made a decision that we transition towards planning that can be zero-based management. So b that means your old merits do not count anymore because uh, because it's uh, new owners of new ideas, of new products, uh, they face most difficulties. If you, you, you may be at the top of the corporate pyramid, you have the largest services and support, but still in reality you generate very little for the company because if you, let's say, generate one-third of revenues, but you need to give uh, some breathing room for those who have new ideas, and they should get the best resources. But for this to be true, we need to change things. So most vulnerable people should be moved. Even those who own old products, they either uh, go up or they just exit, and your old uh, achievements do not count anymore. So these are practical things somewhat, but this is what we are trying to do. This is what we are trying to change, and we center on culture. Culture is key, and I should tell you, it's painful, it's difficult, um, and it's difficult to learn this new culture. The culture is vertical. And, and culture in a business unit because they prefer not to talk to their neighbors to another business unit. They just want to go straight to the CEO and get the best from them. So that's the culture we find not only in our company, but it's very common in many, uh, it's present in multiple state-owned companies and not only. So and that culture needs to be changed. Thank you so much. So let's um, change gear again and come to Eamon because, of course, 
change is also required in, in government with respect to these major social currents we're talking about. And Eamon, you've, uh, you sit on many committees and hold many positions in the uh, Bahrain uh, government. Um, so what can you tell us about uh, changing government institutions uh, for the, these major forces of uh, in innovation in society? Thank you very much. The, um, well, in governments particularly, I think change management uh, is slightly different. Um, and the reason why is because the importance of signaling, the importance of communication is much more uh, important uh, or, or much more impactful, I think, in my opinion, than the private sector. Um, mind you, I had previously had uh, change management roles in the private sector, and so the comparison uh, is, is quite clear. Um, the other bit that I think I would focus on, particularly when it comes to government or maybe very large organizations, um, is the difference between North Star and View North. Uh, it's something that I identify very clearly uh, within our organization. So North Star would be um, a, a planned sort of destination that we're trying to reach. Um, the, the issue with moving an, appara an apparatus as large as ours is the fact that you don't always know what the variables are. You don't always know what the, where the turbulence is going to come from. And therefore, what we agree on is due north as opposed to agreeing on uh, a north star, a specific uh, the, the, the destination. So we look at direction as opposed to uh, destination. The other bit with regards to change management, uh, Martin, that I would also add, I think that's, that's quite important, it's not always the things that you add. Um, I, I think that very similar to, to what Maxim had said, it's, it's also what you remove. Um, we've got an apparatus that looks at, uh, we call it chain of wires, um, just to make sure that we don't get stuck with legacy matters, legacy procedures, legacy policies, legacy or symbolic uh, elements or dogmatic even uh, elements within the institution. Um, we go through these exercises of chain of wise to make sure that um, we remove anything that no longer takes us in the right direction. So I would, I would emphasize both, yes, additions with regards to innovation, but also what you remove is key and elemental um, to, to, to whether you succeed or not. Th thank you very much, Eamon. Um, so we're nearly out of time, but let me end with a, with a blitzkrieg round. Um, so uh, maybe in less than a minute each, um, I'd like to move on to um, uh, not the forces of change or change, but the leadership of change. Um, so I'm looking for some tips to leaders in leading change. Can I start with you, Eve? Um, what would be your tip to leaders in leading change? Yeah, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the end, I think first, Leadership has to be involved, but strongly involved, not just giving money to the innovation team, but personally in time spent every week on innovation. The second, I think, is to give legitimacy and power to the innovation team, which is uh, quite difficult to acquire because you have to manage those two cultures uh, in, under the same roof. And third, uh, I think you need to acquire some skills in innovation. And for me, it's different of managing a company, if you want. We need to have some skills, competencies in entrepreneurship, if you want, in a way. Right. And I think those three things are quite key in this process. Thank you, Eve. Uh, Tom, do you have any thoughts on leading change, perhaps uh, change in yeah. economic policy? Or? Yeah, I think a lot of innov There's a difference between implementation and innovation. A lot of innovation is actually done by the guy in the shop floor or the guy in the lab who's kind of tinkering and kind of um, uh, somehow unleashing that, uh, that energy is, is, that's the motive force of, of, uh, of change. Uh, Sean, any tips to leaders on leading major change given all the complexities and risks we've talked about? Yeah, maybe just a simple one, no matter what size organization you're at, you know, get off the podium and get down out into the plant floor, get out with the sellers, go out, get out with the R&D folks that are creating. And that's where you're going to be able to see what the reality is. And you can also inject directly into that level because steering committees, high level bureaucracy, PowerPoint presentations, they are important at the top end. 
but you have to build that belief from the real soldiers, you know, the real uh, doers of an organization. And frankly, you learn a lot more when you're in the trenches watching and it can actually adjust some of your presentations at the top side as well. Olivier, what, uh, what tips would you have on uh, leading change? Uh, remember that it always starts and ends with, with people. So um, reveal, reveal talents, uh, reveal the talents and not just the young talents, obviously young talents, but also people who have been in your company or in your network of value creation for many, many years. So reveal them continuously. Um, drive everything with a clear purpose. As long as people remember why they do things, they will orient themselves always in the right direction as long as the purpose is clear. And uh, roadmap. Uh, make sure that there is a clear roadmap. And going back to what Sean just said, fuel the reason to believe in this roadmap with uh, real world uh, evidences. What, one really tricky aspect of that is that I think one reason why people are afraid of change is that change often uh, changes the distribution of power. Um, the, the, the people that are relevant to the, to the new situation are not necessarily the ones that are most relevant to the old situation. Um, how, do, how do you manage uh, that, that shift in power during a major transformation process? By ensuring that people feel uh, truly empowered uh, to drive the change. So give them, give them the keys of the truck and, and put them uh, accountable. Tell them uh, it's your business, it's our business, but we trust you. And as, as we discussed all along, uh, as long as people believe that the transformation that they are embarking on is not just a, a tiny modification of before, but a true projection into tomorrow, people will orient themselves uh, uh, truly. Uh, the young, the old, the people who are silent, the very vocal ones, the big bosses and the people in the trenches, um, or everybody comes along as long as there is a clear sense of purpose and a clear roadmap of transformation with uh, milestones that they can see and believe in. Uh, Maxime, you talked about the importance of culture change. Um, and uh, some of the obstacles there. Um, as a leader, how do you cut through all of that inertia, all of that resistance to change? What tips would you have for leaders in, in Russia? So you should listen to your team very carefully. Trust and translate that culture of trust and emphasize those values uh, yourself with your own actions, not only in your verbal communications, and listen carefully to your people, the team, and the clients as well, and support um, that appetite, uh, to ch appetite for change. And I totally agree, there should be faith uh, that uh, those changes are needed. It is very important uh, for, people, uh, to be, for people to believe in those changes and to be enthralled or excited by them, then it's going to work. And, and the last word to you, um, Eamon. Uh, uh, a, government is, uh, a government institution is, a, as, you, as you pointed out, a, a tough environment to implement change in. In some senses, we expect stability from from government, and there are many constraints on change. But uh, in terms of leading change in a, in a public sector context, what, 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 would be, what would be your tips to public sector leaders? So, I mean, two very quick uh, points on that. Uh, number one, just to identify the fact that um, institutional memory does exist. And so uh, when, when uh, a, a new idea, a new innovation is shot down for a legacy, uh, purposes or political reasons and so on, just make a note that that, that sort of resonates for years to come. Um, so I think it, one needs to be very conscious uh, about the institutional memory that's being ingrained. Um, the second thing that I would add is with regards to the constant uh, flow, maybe change in, in, in institutional power, like you had correctly said, my, my recommendation for that is to make sure that you get faith not only in the direction that you're taking, but also in the fact that it needs to be an open, competitive, just environment, uh, which is what we say uh, within our apparatus. As long as there's faith in the fact that there is 
uh, again, it's open, competitive, just in, uh, environment, so a meritocracy, effectively, uh, both meritocracy of individuals, performance, and ideas, um, then, then the shifts in power are, are easier to absorb, I think, uh, by the masses. So those are, I would suggest, the two main items. Th thank you, Eamon. Um, so we're almost out of time. I'd just like to, to thank our, our panelists, uh, uh, Eve Pinier, um, uh, Tom Sargent, Olivia Ribet, Maxime uh, Akimov, Sean Brown, and uh, Ayman Tawfiq uh, Almo Ayad for a, a very special conversation because we've actually gone from the entire journey from science to macroeconomics to, to strategy to change to leadership. And it's very interesting to connect up that, uh, that vector. I think there's a lot of rich lessons here for, uh, for business leaders. So thank you very much, panel. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, it was nice to meet all of you. Thank you to the speakers and dear participants, I would like to remind you about the following thing. Please ask any questions which are interesting to you and comment all the sessions. Ценные подарки. Сделайте ваше участие в конференции максимально продуктивным и запланируйте прямо сейчас живые встречи. Выбрать эксперта и занять свободный временной слот можно в разделе «Участники». Здесь же вам доступна опция отправки персональных сообщений. Мы – транспортно-логистический холдинг «Российские железные дороги». Мы развиваем транспортную инфраструктуру страны, строим новые станции, вокзалы и создаем новые возможности для вашего бизнеса. Лучшие скоростные и высокоскоростные поезда сделают ваше путешествие комфортным и безопасным. Мы – локомотив экономики. Сотни миллионов тонн грузов ежегодно. Развитие науки и социальной сферы – это наш вклад в благосостояние страны и вашу уверенность в завтрашнем дне.
История фантастическая. Есть история сказочная. Есть страшная история. А есть история реальная. В Юка всегда реальная история и диагностика автомобилей с пробегом. Юка официальный сервис Хенда. Смотрите историю и диагностику автомобиля и покупайте его онлайн. If you want to stay ahead of the competition, you need the most advanced solutions to transform your comms performance. From media database to social influencers, distribution to monitoring, analytics to insights, Sijin's cloud-based tools can help you communicate like never before. Звонки ВКонтакте для работы. Больше никаких ограничений по времени и платных функций. 
Звонки ВКонтакте – это разговоры без конца с телефона и ноутбука.